is lovely to be introduced by somebody who actually doesn't know what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to all of you. Thank you all for coming. And I want to give a special thank you also to uh, some of our collaborators tonight, apart from Changing Hands, of course, also to uh, the Department of Transborder Studies, the School of Transborder Studies, with whom we are embarking on many projects at ASU. And some of the magnificent maps that you're going to see here tonight in our presentation, while I speak about Shakespeare, come to us directly from a wonderful map collection you can come and see for free at ASU at the School of Transborder Studies. Just go on the website, look up SDS, and you will see why we are taking such great advantage of them tonight. So thank you very much also to the School of Transborder Studies. And now let's start here. Some of you probably don't think of Shakespeare and Latin America together, but I think you will after this lecture. Let's start right with what you're looking at, and again, my eternal thank you to Kendra for the magnificent visuals that she always provides us with. This is a street in Cusco, and that's Peru, for those of you who haven't yet been there. And this is one of the first places where Shakespeare was performed illegally, of course, in colonial Latin America, because as you can imagine, Shakespeare was banned by that venerable and horrific institution known by the name of, if anybody can guess? Okay. The Inquisition. The Inquisition. Inquisition. Shakespeare's, all of Shakespeare's works were banned by the Inquisition, but it came into Latin America anyway. How is it that it came in? Well, that has to do with another subfield that I often lecture on, pirates. <laughs> Because contraband literature also started to come in already from the early 16th century into Latin America. Um, I'm not saying that these were floating libraries, but one of the ways you would get contraband, um, anything actually, including the literature, was via quote-unquote illegal trade. So thanks to the gentleman pirate William Dampierre, who was a botanist and a... Uh, biology professor by day and pirated on the weekend <laughs> in Yucatan at the end of the 17th century. That is actually the first place where we know of Shakespeare's works being illegally presented. Many times it wasn't that the actual verse of Shakespeare that was presented, simply the stories, okay, because people were translating this very much on the sly. And in the early 18th century we already have from records of the Inquisition in Lima, uh, in Peru, uh, reports that indecent works of Shakespeare, obras independes, as we say in Spanish, had uh, been presented partially in the Andean area. So some of this was coming in through contraband, as great literature often will. Now, every time we say Shakespeare in the New World, the most cliched thing to think of is The Tempest. Yes, The Tempest has something to do with the New World. Yes, it is only one of 14 of Shakespeare's plays that deals with the New World. That might strike you as a surprise. And I love The Tempest, but I'm hardly going to talk about it here because it has been spoken about ad nauseum in relationship to the New World. It is a magnificent play. It is not the only one. Yes, its shipwreck is based on the story of a real live shipwreck in Bermuda. Yes, it does deal not so indirectly with colonialism and the colonialists and the colonial lies, but it is not the only one of Shakespeare's that does so. For the English-speaking public, I guarantee those of you who speak English, you've probably always heard of The Tempest as being the one play that deals with the New World. Again, it is not the only one, very far from the only one. By the way, physical mentions of the New World, meaning America per se, are in 15 of Shakespeare's plays. If you want the quotes afterwards, I'm not going to give them to you right now, please go attack my friend Kendra over there and she'll give you out all of our information so you can write to me and I will give you the bibliographical quote. So Shakespeare as a man of his time was of course very aware of the New World. Why? Because England and Spain were in a death grip over that New World. This is the age of empire, don't forget that. Shakespeare is writing in the Age of Empire. Spain's New World Empire, Portugal's New World Empire, and what England was very much hoping and which would eventually become its New World Empire. In Latin America and the Caribbean, from the end of the 18th century through the beginning of the 21st century, the three plays that have been most performed, I am at this point only speaking about Spanish Latin America and completely taking out 
Brazil, which is a hugely important country and which I respect very much, but it is not, in this case, in my field of expertise. So I'm not going to dare to speak about it. Wisdom is knowing when to shut up. I am going to speak about, there is a wonderful person here who does deal with Brazil, but I will embarrass her at the end. Um, I am going to speak about Spanish America. Okay, so just please be aware, yes, Brazil has its own trajectory with Shakespeare and a very rich one. This is different. So in Spanish-speaking Latin America and the English-speaking Caribbean and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, these three tales, these three plays, A Winter's Tale, Coriolanus, and Cymbeline, give a more accurate depiction of the Americas from the point of view of those who present them. There's a reason that they are presented much more than The Tempest. Okay, and just so you don't forget, again, this is the age of empire, the age of exploration, sailing, voyages, and the tremendous damage that results from the voyages was in Shakespeare's mind all the time. Don't forget, Shakespeare act Shakespeare's career gets going three years before the defeat of the Spanish Armada, right? So this idea of who controls the seas is extremely important at the time that Shakespeare is writing. <coughs> Let's start with a winter's tale, okay? The new world has the old world's name. I am quoting from the webpage of a wonderful university in Argentina, La Universidad Nacional de Cuyo. Cuyo National University leads all of Latin America's universities in the Spanish-speaking part of Latin America regarding Shakespearean research. That is something I give to those of you who want to see what's going on in the Spanish-speaking world regarding Shakespeare, and yes, their webpage is translated into English. So that might be very interesting to, for you to see, okay, so how is Shakespeare viewed in Latin America? Why is A Winter's Tale considered preferable to The Tempest? Why is A Winter's Tale where that great quote that you saw we put on the PowerPoint, a world ransomed or one destroyed? comes from. Why A Winter's Tale? Because unlike The Tempest, A Winter's Tale deals more with the physical conflict between Old and New World. <coughs> There's a place in A Winter's Tale called Bohemia. But it's not Bohemia. I, mean, I, I say Bohemia, you should think of crystals and, and elegant German princes dancing with elegant German princesses. This is not it. The new Bohemia is a threatening desert, and there is no divine or magical intervention. In A Winter's Tale, the story does not, in any way, shape, or form, deal with magic. What it deals with is human deception. And those who are exiled to this threatening new world, because it's a threatening new world, it's not the tempest of, oh, brave new world, a world that has such creatures in it. It's, yech, what did we come to? <laughs> this new world has no sprites, nor does it have any, any um, frightening monsters such as Caliban. It's just people. And those who go to the new world are those who are thrown out of the old world without any understanding of whom they will meet in the new world, and often with no hope of redemption. So there is no divine intervention in a winter's tale. A major character in A Winter's Tale is a woman by the name of Hermione who is distrusted by her husband and therefore supposedly killed and we will find later only banished. Now A Winter's Tale, Utopia in the Desert. Shakespeare deals a lot with this idea of utopia, the perfect place. The New World was supposed to be a perfect place, except we know, of course, it was a place of civilizations every bit as complicated and bloody as Europe's. We know, of course, when Europe came to the New World, it probably would not win the Nobel Peace Prize for its behavior there. Nor would the Aztecs or the Incas. It was a place like any other. It is a very human place. And this is also why, in Latin America, the preference for Shakespeare's play would be A Winter's Tale and not The Tempest, which many Latin American directors regard as a little too pretty and magical and sprightly. In A Winter's Tale, we deal with this idea of utopia and the desert. The new Bohemia is that <coughs> desert, and it is referred to constantly as a threatening desert. How is it different from the old Bohemia? Throughout the play, we have constant references to the familiar that I remember and this language now that I cannot decipher. This idea of undeciphered languages is very, very prominent in A Winter's Tale. Why is the desert in this new world? You're looking at an image of the desert and next to it an image of what Jamaica actually looks like. So before you all run off on your trip there, let's contrast these two ideas. 
when you say the word utopia, you're talking about an idea from Shakespeare's time. Actually, a little prior to Shakespeare's time, the thinker Thomas More. Utopia, in Latin, a place that does not exist. Well, that's actually what it means. And this idea of transposing a perfect world, an utopia, on the new world, when obviously there was little understanding of the civilizations that existed in the new world, and obviously not all the Europeans were united in their conception of utopia either, creates a complete chaos. It is that chaos that Shakespeare very clearly delineates in A Winter's Tale, to the point that you don't even know whether the person you're talking to is living or dead. Okay, it's that, that confusion. So at one point, when the king is talking to his wife Hermione, he does not know whether she is alive or stuffed. Yeah, it gets, gets kind of gross. <laughs> that was also a practice at that time, you might not know, the Borgias were very fond of that. Stuffing their former enemies. Yeah, hope you wait before this. <laughs> this confusion, what is living, what is dead, what is human, was also an ethical debate, you know, at that time. To the point that the Pope in 1536 had to issue a bula, a formal papal declaration declaring the Native Americans to be human beings in response to some rather inhumane actions of the conquistadors. And so let's take a look at what Shakespeare says. Now, I'd like you first to take a look at this magnificent map, which again, thank you very much, Transborder Studies have an incredible collection of colonial maps. People put through here, when I use the term colonial, it's the same as Renaissance. It's the same time period. I don't know why sometimes people forget that. Uh, it's the same time period. And if you look at this map, not only do you see the image of the Americas that Shakespeare would have been more or less familiar with. It's much more North America than South America. You have North America, Central America, and South America just kind of appears there at the bottom. That's the part called the Spanish Main, which we all know that English and Irish pirates used to attack. But that was an earlier lecture that I gave, so we won't get into that. That's the part the English knew. That's the part the English knew. North America, obviously because it was less under Spanish control, will be more inviting to them from an imperial sense. Queen Elizabeth's sorcerer and astrologist, John Dee, wanted Elizabeth to colonize North America, believing that Elizabeth was the descendant of King Arthur, which is about as historically true as anything else you could dream of, <laughs> and that earlier in the 12th century, a Welsh prince by the name of Prince Maddock, also supposedly descended from King Arthur, had actually been in North America. Is any of this true? No, obviously it's sheer mythology. But when you look at this map and you look at the images which Europeans had of peoples in the New World, note the scantily clad native woman. Okay, it seems that ever since Cortez took up with uh, Malinche in Mexico, this has been the rather stereotyped image of the seductress, which is a European fantasy. It also did not correspond in any way, shape, or form to the Malinche herself. Notice the image of the black slaves, okay, on the side. You see? Okay, so this is Europe, to a certain degree, creating its own new world. Shakespeare was a man of his time, which means he could be brilliant, and it means he could also be imperialist, and he could be perceptive, and he could be racist. He could be all of those things. But when he's brilliant, he's brilliant, yes. So let's take a look at this magnificent comment from A Winter's Tale. There was speech in their dumbness. Dumbness does not mean stupidity. Dumbness, of course, we're referring to the older English meaning of it, meaning simply muteness, okay? So there was speech in their... Muteness, dumbness, language in their very gesture. They looked as if they had heard of a world ransomed or one destroyed. Now, the greatest Latin American writer of all time, yes, I'm totally giving away the fact that I am of Argentine background, that's Borges. So, of course, now every Colombian in the audience is saying, no, it's Monica! Um, and God knows what the Brazilians can say for us. It's Jorge Amado, but for me it's Borges. <coughs> Have referred to this quote as probably the most accurate depiction of what happened to the New World. A world ransomed or a world destroyed. Entire civilizations ransacked. Horrific bloodshed. Please do not romanticize that period at all. And a new world being born in it. So it's a world ransomed and a world destroyed. It is a world where 10 million black slaves were brought. 
with half of them dying on the way. That's the horrific Middle Passage. It's a world where at least half of the indigenous population was destroyed. It's a world also where indigenous populations could themselves be every bit as brutal as the Europeans who conquered them. A world ransomed or one destroyed. From the point of view of Borges, that is the Americas and not a oh, brave new world. A world that has such creatures in it. That would be a little too romanticized. And then again, the worldview that Shakespeare would have had, focusing much more on the Spanish main, Central America, already very well known to the English of his time. How? Through piracy. Have you heard of Francis Drake? <laughs> yeah, pirates come into this all the time. I'm not saying Francis Drake was bringing the library in a conscious way, but after Spain was beaten in 1588, <coughs> there is a growth of contraband literature in Latin America, many of which come, a lot of which comes from England and Spain. Why? That's not accidental. Once the news got back to Spanish America that Spain was no longer invincible, frankly, intellectuals got a little bolder. Okay, and this is why the historian Marcus Redeker notes, and he's done exceedingly boring but interesting <laughs> statistical research on how following 1588, the amount of contraband literature translated from English into Spanish, from English and French, rises up, increases in the Americas. The Age of Empire. Okay. So Shakespeare in the New World. Now again, you have a magnificent map that we have from transborder studies showing a little closer how Shakespeare and someone of his time would have imagined this new world. Now, were they still calling it a new world? At that point, actually not, I have to tell you. The, the use of the term new world will actually be more prevalent in both English and Spanish literature from the 18th century on when it certainly wasn't new. Okay? And that's also interesting because that's a kind of post-mortem fact that's stuck on the New World. For Shakespeare, it would have been the Americas, all right? Or it would have been the lands across the sea. And how would that vicarious understanding of the Americas and this consciousness of Spain all the time have influenced Shakespeare's plays? Well, if you want to do an interesting experiment, just Google Shakespeare, got that? Spain's hot breath. Why? Because that one phrase appears constantly in Shakespeare's plays. Spain's hot breath, is this a reference to the Inquisition? Is it a reference to war? Is it a reference to the fact that England and Spain had no peace? The default condition was war. Please don't think the default condition is peace. And then war breaks out. The default condition is war, and peace occasionally breaks out. Mm -hmm. And this was even more so during this was true even more so during Shakespeare's time. England viewed itself during Shakespeare's time as on the rise following the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Shakespeare's first plays are a few years before the defeat of the Spanish Armada. For example, of Midsummer Night's Dreams, 1585. But actually, a lot of the plays we're going to talk about tonight are from the period of James, who comes to power when, once Elizabeth dies in 1603. Coriolanus is another play, by the way, if you have not seen the magnificent film of Ralph Fiennes, go and see it. Coriolanus is slightly getting his head chopped off, which is quite adequate in terms of what happens to Coriolanus in the play. He doesn't get his head chopped off, but he does not die nicely. Um, and if we talk about Coriolanus and the Romans, I want you to take a look now at Mexico, and I want you to see that where you are was Mexico. Please don't forget that, because historically, maps create their own reality, yeah? So you're now used to the post-1848, post-Gadsden purchase map. Where you are, the American Southwest was Mexico. It was called La Gran Chichimeca. Well, that's what it was called by the Spanish conquistadors, based on what the Aztecs called it, the savage area. Oh, there was something always a little weird about the Southwest because the Aztecs couldn't conquer the native people here either. And you see images of the King's Road. Now take a look at where it goes because it goes pretty far up into the Southwest. Obviously crisscrosses Mexico through the city we used to call Tenochtitlan when the Aztecs were running it, when the Mexica people were running it, and it stops 
when you get into Yucatan, because the Mayans were never easily defeated. You could even make an argument to say they were never defeated. But the old Aztec trade route became the Spanish trade route. Writers of Shakespeare's time compare the Aztecs to the Romans. You're trying to understand this empire, the Aztecs were like the Romans, the Mayans were like the Greeks. Coriolanus, <coughs> Shakespeare's play which deals with Rome, which deals with a man who despises the common people but needs their support. Mm, that's Coriolanus himself. A man who is willing to, and we quote Shakespeare, counterfeit his words so that the common people will like him, except the common people obviously get wind of him. This idea of the Roman demagogue comes back very strongly in the period of Elizabeth I and James I. So where are we historically? You're talking about the second half of the 16th century, first half of the 17th century. Old Rome and New Rome. The Old Rome was Rome. The New Rome was usually referred to as Tenochtitlan, the Aztecs, Mexico, and then later, much later, that idea was transposed to the Incan Empire in South America. But Shakespeare would have been much less familiar with that because the documents on the Incan Empire had not been yet translated into English at that point, whereas almost all of the then published documents on the Aztecs were translated into English, including Las Casas very important Spanish defender of, of the Indians, for those who know or don't know him. El Camino Real, the Royal Road and the Appian Way. Well, yes, so in the Spanish court chronicles of Philip II, that was Queen Elizabeth's nemesis, who also, of course, had wanted to marry her and married her sister, Bloody Mary, but remained kind of stuck on Elizabeth. <coughs> and his successor, Philip III, Felipe II and Felipe III, they modeled El Camino Real, the Royal Road, on the idea of the Appian Way. This is not my opinion. If you read the Spanish court chroniclers of the time, including Palacio de Rubios, I may be throwing names at you. It's not to impress you for a cocktail party. It's just so you know there are sources you can go back to. And again, I encourage you very much at the end of the lecture, come to us, invade us. Kendra, you're looking very Spanish with the fan. Okay, invade her. The outreach coordinator. We will give you information on how to get in touch with us and to receive more information. So there is this conscious displacement of the classical empire of Rome from the old world to the new world. When Shakespeare wrote Coriolanus, this most unpleasant person, because Coriolanus is a real anti-hero. In fact, he's a complete anti-hero. He never becomes a hero. It was a bit of a challenge to perform. The play was first performed in 1609. Queen Elizabeth had already been dead for six years. <coughs> James I was on the throne. James I, as opposed to Elizabeth Tudor, was openly imperialist. Why well, am I saying openly imperialist? Sure, Elizabeth had her tendencies as well. But it is James who will send the massive English armies into Ireland. We all know how wonderful that ended up, don't we, 400 years later. Okay, England's imperial policy in Ireland, very similar to Spain's colonial policy in the New World. And so this idea of the Roman demagogues was also entering the theater more during James's time. Look at this quote from Act Two, Scene Two. It's talking about Coriolanus, the demagogue himself, who wants to be elected to the Roman Senate, but has a problem because the common people don't like him. Even his mother does not like him. That's harsh. As weeds before a vessel under sail, so men obeyed and fell before his stem. Please note the nautical metaphors. Okay, again, this is the age of exploration, sailing ships, conquest. The great Shakespearean scholar Anthony Burgess, calculating the amount of metaphors in Shakespeare's plays, has found more nautical metaphors than any other metaphor. That's obviously natural for the time. <coughs> From face to foot, in the original text it says he, referring to the ship, was a thing of blood whose every motion was timed with dying cries. Remember that of every ship that set sail, okay, I'm going to give you a horrible statistic, from 1550 to 1650, okay, and this is also when England and Spain are going at each other's throats, uh, in the most active manner. The statistic is one out of five ships did not come back. So when you signed on for a voyage, 
you were playing a very strong game of Russian roulette. And in Shakespeare's plays, the consciousness of that impending death, one out of five, would you take a job where you had a one out of five chance of dropping death? <laughs> that comes into every play. Now, Cymbeline is probably one of Shakespeare's oddest plays. People, people often say it's unperformable, it's insane, it's completely crazy. It is. But I have to tell you, a wonderful version of it was done at the uh, Shakespeare Festival in, in, excuse me, in Ashland, in Oregon, where they warned people, it's going to take five hours, deal with it. <laughs> and it did. It's a crazy play. But it is also the play, from the point of view of Latin American scholars, Spanish-speaking Latin American scholars, in Argentina and Colombia and Mexico, which are the three countries in which Shakespeare is most performed in Latin America. It is this play which deals most directly with the religious conflict of the conquest of the New World. Dealing with what? Obviously Christianizing the quote-unquote pagan Indians. Because what does Cymbeline deal with? Well, it's Romanizing, the equivalent of what would have been Christianizing, the pagan Britons, okay? The early Celts who occupied the islands. Well, the Celts keep on coming. The Irish keep on coming back. And we have this idea of the empire, Rome. Okay, again, the prevalence of Rome. Cymbeline, of course, is also from the later period. This is post-Elizabeth. This is from the period of James. In fact, the three of those plays are, folks. They were performed in 1609, A Winter's Tale. Cymbeline and Coriolanus are performed between 1610 and 1611, so Elizabeth is long gone. And England is every bit as much embarked on its career of open empire as Spain had been before. And so this idea of Christianizing, or quote-unquote civilizing, native people had an obvious metaphor. What I'm saying to you is that those who went to the Blackfriars Theater where this play was performed, you're maybe used to hearing about the Swan or the Globe, but the later theater for Shakespeare is Blackfriars, and these are the later plays. Anyone looking at this would have gotten the illusion. They would have gotten the reference. So pagans, Romans, Incans, and the conquest. By the time Cymbeline was written, the first major Spanish chronicle on the conquest of the Incas, and now we're in South America. Okay, Mexico is not South America. Does that come as a surprise to anybody? <laughs> Mexico is North America. Central America is not South America. South America is Panama on down. And you are looking at what now would be Peru and Bolivia, which would have been Tawantinsuyu, the ancient Inca Empire, part of it. It extended beyond that. It wasn't quite as wide as it, as it is here. But this area would have become known to Englishmen much more beginning in the early 17th century. Yes, some Englishmen had already skirted the coast of the Pacific, and they tended to be the pirates. That was Francis Drake. That was Martin Frobisher. Most people, unfortunately, were not pirates, so you probably read about it in the book. And what you read about here was the idea of El Dorado, which, by the way, does not come from there. It comes from Colombia, which is farther up. But in the consciousness of the time, there was often no differentiation between regions. By the way, the term Colombia didn't even exist. It would have been called in Spanish Nueva Granada. Okay, so we are in a nebulous region for most Englishmen of Shakespeare's time. North America and the Caribbean were much less nebulous. Their people had been conquered earlier. Their stories were more known to the British. And don't forget, the British were pirating around the Caribbean. So they were much more aware of the Atlantic than the Pacific. But this idea of El Dorado, of a magical area made out of gold, Shakespeare will reference it actually in the Henry plays, and Voltaire will give an entire chapter to it in Candide, where he wrongfully puts it in Peru. When the actual origin of the legend is from the Lake of Guatavita in Colombia. South America was still a mystery to the English-speaking world in Shakespeare's time. That only begins to change very little with a very gallant man who laid his cloak on the floor for Queen Elizabeth to walk over, if you want to believe that old canard. I rather doubt she would have gotten her feet muddy and Sir Walter Raleigh was too much of a dandy to put his best cloak on the floor. <laughs> but Sir Walter Raleigh was a great courtier. He was a fine poet and he was an explorer. He was also a mercenary and a pirate and everything like that. And he led an important expedition into what is now British Guiana, the very end of the 16th century. 
But in that expedition, when Raleigh found, well, he wasn't the first one to find it, but when he came face to face with the river called the Orinoco, this for him was very different to any reports of North or Central America which were more mapped by that point. And Sir Walter Raleigh has a fascinating quote, which I, I think Shakespeare would have loved to have said, but he didn't. So let's quote Raleigh. At the very end of the 16th century, actually in the early 17th century when he's writing his memoirs, and he's in the Tower of London, where King James is put. <laughs> fell out of favor. And he writes, I fear, this is a fascinating quote, I fear that cartography has made the immaterial immaterial. You think about that quote. Because I think that is absolutely amazing. This idea of the unknown world <coughs> begins to vanish by the end of the 16th century. <coughs> the reality of an ugly conquest in the new world, the mapping of the new world, there were very few <coughs> unknown paradises left anymore. So Cymbeline, one of Shakespeare's last and most confusing and I think most brilliant plays, deals with chaos in Britain, Rome, and Rome, and in its time, even Shakespeare's contemporaries, such as Ben Jonson, remarked that it seemed to evoke, they didn't use the term reference, that's a very academic 20th, 20th century term, but that it evoked the empires of the New World. At that point, there's still no reference to the Incas, but to the Aztecs, yes. Because even Hernán Cortés, the conquistador himself, in his letters of relation, remarked on how much the Aztec city Tenochtitlan appeared to him to be organized according to Roman principles. Okay, so this was a very common idea. Mortality is a concept in Shakespeare and the conquest. One thing that the Shakespearean scholar Anthony Burgess points out is that Shakespeare and every person of his day would have been much more comfortable with death than we are. So in Cymbeline, at one point, when Imogen, one of the princesses in the play, is fondling what appears to be the head of her dead husband, you look at it and say, Ugh! Would people necessarily have said that in the Blackfriars Theater? Maybe not. This horror that we feel, and I think this is a very important point to remember, before body parts, before dismembering, before any one of a number of unpleasant things for us, might not have been the feeling at that point. Death was a more common daily occurrence, and we have to be very, very careful here about saying that Shakespeare was working the grotesque. We don't know if it would have been grotesque in his time. And as Anthony Burgess points out, when certain rites in the New World would strike us as quite unpleasant, as unpleasant as the Spanish Inquisition burning someone alive was the Aztec practice of human sacrifice. For the Aztecs it might not have been that revolting. Be very careful to categorize issues in Shakespeare. And in Cymbeline, I point this out particularly because Cymbeline is filled with these types of, um, of episodes, of people's heads being spoken to without their bodies around, of living and dead bodies transposed as they are in a winter's tale as well. I don't know that this would have evoked horror. This also might have been simply what the reality was. Notice in this very interesting map, again, we have the unknown geographical extremes. And this is important for Cymbeline, because Cymbeline is placed in unknown Britain, first century Britain. To an Englishman of Shakespeare's time, that England, 1,600 years ago, was far away in terms of consciousness. To an Englishman of Shakespeare's time, the northern part of the Americas, where the English looked for something you may have heard of as mythical as El Dorado. The Spanish were obsessed with El Dorado. What were the English obsessed with? A point to anyone who knows? New Passage. New Passage. New Passage. Northwest Passage, exactly. The Northwest Passage that supposedly would facilitate your route to the Pacific. This was the British mythology. This idea of the unknown and the mythical, remember, as Sir Raleigh as Sir Walter Raleigh wrote, it was already beginning to di disappear by the time Shakespeare is writing these last plays. And so it is no longer the tempest of O Brave New World, although that's interesting because that may actually be Shakespeare's last play. Shakespeare is struggling with this idea, and this is one of the things that makes him such a brilliant playwright, with ambiguity. The ugliness of the conquest of the New World, as it was very well known by that time, 
and still that phantom of that beautiful paradise, which is why you have, you know, Prospero's speech at the end of, of The Tempest. You have this idea of it may be possible to retake paradise. I think Shakespeare knew better than that, but that idea is there too. So in Cymbeline, you have a fusion of the ancient Britons, or the Celts, and Native Americans. Now, do any of you recognize this picture? Do you have, any of you have any idea where this picture might be from? Because Kendra and I are playing with you with this picture. We'll be nice. So there was a very great illustrator, an American illustrator at the end of the 19th century named Howard Pyle. Some of you may have looked at beautiful, beautiful examples of the King Arthur stories that he did. Now Howard Pyle, in terms of historical accuracy, throw that man out the window. But in terms of sheer beauty of his illustrations, they're quite lovely. And in his time, he was known for kind of combining Native American and Celtic motifs. So I could tell you that's Morgana Le Fay. I could tell you that's Pocahontas or the Malinche. I could tell you probably anything. Because it is a little bit deliberately nondescript. Many Englishmen of Shakespeare's time, including the great painter John White, whose daughter, by the way, came to the first colony the English put up in the New World that didn't work. Roanoke, have any of you heard of? So John White, when he painted the aboriginals, meaning the Algonquin Indians, around what was the Roanoke colony, actually didn't make them look that different than this. He fused Celtic and Native American motifs. That was in Shakespeare's mind. That was in the Elizabethan mindset. It continues in the mindset of those who lived under James. And among British and American illustrators of the 19th century, it becomes even stronger. I have to tell you, by the way, that a wonderful Native American writer by the name of Wilma Mankiller, isn't that a brilliant? <laughs> Very strong Cherokee lady, um, has also spoken about the use of Howard Pyle's, what she calls Native American insinuated images, to deal with how Native people are perceived, even though supposedly, who is that really? Well, not really, because she didn't exist really, but that is supposedly the nymph. Vivian, when some of the Arthurian stories is the one who seduces Merlin. But she could be Pocahontas and the Malinche. What I do want you to remember is that in Shakespeare's mind, in Cymbeline, and in the time itself, the ancient Celt and the Native American were fused into an equivalency. Somebody should be asking the obvious question, would that have any influence on the way Irish people were treated? <laughs> I'm not Irish, but sometimes I seem to be. Yes. And you will find in some English chronicles, particularly those of the father of the great Elizabethan poet, Sir Philip Sidney, his father, Henry Sidney, who was a colonial official in Ireland, frequently compared the wild Irish Celts to the uncivilized aboriginals of the Americas. So what Howard Pyle does in a romanticized way, what Shakespeare did in a very interesting dramatic way, People also did in a very nasty colonial way. Now, take a look at this speech because <clears throat> as a wonderful contemporary Colombian writer by the name of William Ospina, magnificent, one of, in my opinion, one of the finest writers in contemporary Latin America, says if you want great speeches dealing with Native American <laughs> independence, go to Shakespeare's symbol. Now whether this is simply the way Ospina is interpreting it, or not. I have to tell you it is quite interesting because in Bogota, in the capital of Colombia, Cymbeline is a play which has been performed in translation many, many times. So it's interesting, the Colombians never found it unperformed. We have a different conception of time in Latin America, so you can hang out. <laughs> oh, my watch. Cymbeline, who was the first century, historically there was a Cymbeline, first century pagan, Brit Briton, of Celtic background, says in Shakespeare's play, you must know, till the injurious Romans did extort this tribute from us, we were free. Well, couldn't that be the Mayans or the Incans talking about before the Spanish came? Or couldn't it be the Yaoyo Indians talking about before the Incans came? It's anybody talking about a pre-colonial period. Caesar's ambition now, the Spanish sovereigns always compared themselves to Caesar. Elizabeth Tudor was too intelligent to do that, but her successor James did that all the time. 
That's the James of the King James Bible. Caesar's ambition, which swelled so much that it did almost stretch the sides of the world, what better parallel for the age of empire? And look at this map. How many of you would assign this in a geography class? It is a mess. But it's a magnificent colonial mess. And I want you to see that the value also of these maps is not in their accuracy. It is in the vision of the cosmos that they convey. And so, can any of you pick out okay, a, a point for anybody who can more or less tell me where is Peru on this map? Where's Florida on this map? You got Florida. That's an easy one. Right? That, that, that's, that's the easy question. Okay? So Florida, right? The floral land. Nova Hispania, New Spain, all right? You see Mexico? Right? You see Central America? My, my Indian friends of mine would love this map because, boy, that makes Central America almost as big as South America. And we've arrived. And Amazonas, there we have the Amazon River. Well, South America gets a bit smushed. But this is also explaining to you that the concept of what South America was was not clear at that point. So were you a pagan? Were you an Incan? Were you an Amazonian? Were you... So in the English mind, it all got subsumed under the term Britain. Oh, they're just like the ancient Celts. Which is why when the English artist John White accompanied his daughter to the Roanoke colony, by the way, the first English child born in the New World was their grandchild. Have you ever heard the name Virginia Dare? <laughs> When he painted the Algonquin Indians, Elizabeth, when she received those paintings, is said to have laughed and said, you haven't painted Indians, you painted the Irish. <laughs> is there any hope? Is it just endless conflict? Well, again, I point out to you that in Shakespeare's time, I might even say in our time, the default situation is war. When there's peace, it's unusual. It's a horrible thing to say, but it's true. Um, around the time Shakespeare writes Cymbeline, actually just two years earlier, he'd written another play called Titus Andronicus. Now, if any of you have ever seen Titus Andronicus performed, if you have not seen the stage version, go see Anthony Hopkins' absolutely magnificent filmic version. I've always found it to be one of the strongest anti-war statements ever made because it ends up literally with everybody eating each other. So you either make peace or you just eat each other. Literally. There's very little hope in Titus Andronicus, although there is actually at the end. There's a young boy who walks away with an old man. Maybe the two who survived that banquet. Somehow there might be some hope. In Cymbeline, and you wonder what was going on in Shakespeare's mind, because I repeat, James I was not Elizabeth. Elizabeth had some colonial nonsense in the head, as any ruler of the time would have, but she was also capable of seeing through that, as some of you know when she met the Irish pirate Grace O'Malley. There was another part of Elizabeth that could sometimes see through the colonial issues. James could not. James wanted Ireland colonized. He wanted what he could of the New World colonized. And so when Shakespeare writes this, people, I have to tell you, this was something which got Shakespeare in trouble with James. Now, why should it get Shakespeare in trouble with James when he's ostensibly speaking about the ancient Romans and the ancient Britons 1,600 years earlier? But as you know by now, he wasn't only speaking about that. And the clear allusion to the New World, because whenever the Celts are mentioned in Shakespearean literature, <coughs> they always stand in, bless you, for either the Irish or the Native Americans, right? So the Imperial Caesar, look at what comes from the very end of the play, Act 5, Scene 5. The Imperial Caesar should again unite his favor with the radiant Cymbeline, which shines here in the West. How do you like Shakespeare's use of West? That could apply to Britain, west of Rome. It can also, of course, apply to the New World, west of Europe, right? The lands of the West. What was the call of the English mariners at that point? Westward ho, that meant you were going to the Americas. Set me forward. Let a Roman and a British ensign wave friendly together. Our peace will ratify, seal it with feasts. This is one of a number of quotes that got Shakespeare in trouble. Okay. The English 
filmmaker, sometimes a bit sensationalist, but sometimes interesting, Michael Wood, has actually compiled a list of quotes that got Shakespeare in trouble. <laughs> so the illusion, whether James took this as referring to Native Americans, who we also want to colonize, remember Jamestown? James, that James, folks. Hmm. Or the Irish, right next door, easier to colonize. There was an insinuation here for peace, which probably would not have been much to James' liking. Now, we at ACMRS need your help. If you don't want to end up like um, poor Yorick skull here in Hamlet, no, that's a kind of forceful person. But what you're looking at is an image from a wonderful theater company in Jamaica, which is called the Little Theater Company. It's not a little theater company, it's actually a very big. Shakespearean Company in Kingston Town, the capital of Jamaica. And this is an image from a, a production of Hamlet, which was done in Jamaica. Jamaica, which was part of the Spanish Empire, passes to the British Empire in 1665 and then just passes to the pirates, thank God. <laughs> Has a very interesting tradition regarding Shakespeare. Once a year, five days before Christmas, black and white mummers, okay, pantomime artists, literally go through the Blue Mountains in Jamaica. Okay, that's not the coastal part, that's the interior where the mountains are, where the rum is made, Blue Mountain rum. Ring any bells? And recite Shakespeare from memory. Now I want to point out to you that many linguists note that the way a Jamaican would recite Shakespeare is actually much closer to what you would have heard in Blackfriars because the particular dialect of English which the dialects, I should say, of English, which are spoken in England now, are farther from Shakespeare's time than those spoken in the West Indies when Englishmen of actually a little bit later than Shakespeare's time colonized the area. Okay, so this relationship, this very fraught relationship with the New World and Shakespeare, is one which I think serves for further study, and let me end this with why I decided to ignore The Tempest. And now let me talk just two more minutes about The Tempest and then take your questions and say goodnight, sweet prince, as we say. <laughs> with less bodies on the stage. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of Bring the cards, take them out. Um, the Tempest is a great play. I was a little risky here tonight by not mentioning it, but I also knew in a cliched sense if I said Shakespeare in the Americas, that would be the only thing <laughs> that you think of. So I do encourage you to take a look at what is considered in Spanish-speaking Latin America as much more representative of the situation of the New World than The Tempest. That does not mean The Tempest is not a great play. It is a magnificent play. And in fact, one of Latin America's finest poets a man by the name of Ruben Dario, absolutely one of the greatest of, considered, well, the Latin American Byron, okay? Wrote extensively about the Tempest, but what he thought about the Tempest, this is Dario writing at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, is that that was Shakespeare's greatest unfinished play. Why unfinished? Because Ruben Dario believed that if you read the last scene of the Tempest well, he read it in both English and Spanish. There is an insinuation that Prospero and Caliban will eventually make a pact. Now Caliban, of course, is the figure that most English-speaking critics say is representative of the colonialized population, of, of either Africans forcibly taken to the New World or Native Americans, obviously, already of the New World. What Dario saw is that there is a kind of transition in Prospero's thinking from typical European colonialists to possible renegade. Whether or not that is true, and God knows there are 10,000 ways to read Shakespeare, I do think that interpretation is worth looking into because it would make the Tempest more relevant to the very messy and interesting world of Latin American politics rather than the total romanticization, which is the way The Tempest is often presented to English-speaking audiences. And yes, it is a great play, and you should read it, and I ignored it deliberately, but at least now you know something 
a bit more about a winter style in Coriolanus on Sunday.